Hi, my name is Carmen Imes. I am Associate Professor of Old Testament at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University in Southern California. Dr. Carmen Imes. Carmen, great to see you. Thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. Good to see you. Thanks for having me back. Well, you did a great job before, and we, that podcast has been heard lots and lots. But today we're going to talk about another topic coming out of Genesis. And it really directly touches some things that you've said in a recent book entitled Being God's Image, Why Creation Still Matters, published by IVP Press. And it's, in fact, it's still warm it's still right <laughs> off the press kind of thing. So. Yes, yes. You got the sneak peek. You have an advanced reader copy. It comes out June 6th, 2023. So I'm, I'm, I even have the advanced reader copy. You do. Yeah. So, all right. The topic we're going to talk about today, on exegetically, exegetically speaking, is uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And a lot of people make hay out of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of mm -hmm. stuff and a lot of people write about it. So set that up for us. What's going on in Genesis 1, 26 through 28? Well, it's a, it's a commonly quoted passage because it's the climax of God's creative work in Genesis 1. It's the place where he makes humans. And of course, if we want to understand what it means to be human, we should go back to the beginning and see what does God say when God makes us. And I think um, that's why it's been so central. There are a lot of questions we have that aren't answered. And so I think one thing that happens is, is people come back to Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and they want to see even more there than what there is. And so, <laughs> so there's a tendency to exploit the pronouns, the, the prepositions, the every noun, like to, to really dig in and try to see what each one means. It's helpful to know Hebrew, to, mm. to dig into these discussions, because every little letter makes a difference uh, mm. in these verses. A lot hangs on a preposition here, right? Yeah. And, you know, when I was in uh, biblical languages classes in college, when I was in Greek, our Greek professor would always tell us, don't create doctrines out of prepositions, because <laughs> prepositions are too flexible. And I think we'll see that with this passage, that the mm. preposition attached to the word image is flexible enough that it's given rise to lots of different interpretations. Hmm. So the preposition, what is the preposition attached to the word image? In, in Hebrew... What is that preposition? So it's just one letter in Hebrew, the, the letter bait, which makes the b sound in English. And it's it's attached to the word selim, which means image. And so it's batselim or batsal, batsalmenu is the first time we see it in our image or as our image or uh, <laughs> according to our image or however, yeah. however you translate the b. Yeah. So, I mean, when you look at that and you say, okay, I have a preposition here, it's actually attached mm -hmm. to the word, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a separate word, but attached to right, the word. Right, it's attached. And that's typical in Hebrew. It's not unusual yes. at all. So the question is, how do you go about making the decision what that word means or what that preposition means that's yeah. attached? Well, I think, David, one thing that people do kind of at, just as an initial there, there's an initial default translation of a preposition that you learn when you take Hebrew. Mm. And so, b means in or at. And so, okay, we're going to plug that in everywhere we see it. And that's kind of the first take. And so, that would be, God said, let us make humans in our image, because in is a very common translation of b. But if we want to actually unpack what this is saying and not distort it, then we need to look at what are the patterns of usage more broadly in Scripture? Mm. What are the possibilities? Under what circumstances does it mean in? Because our English prepositions are also flexible, and they don't map over onto Hebrew prepositions exactly in exactly the same ways. Mm. And so there are times when the b means in very clearly, but there are other times when it doesn't. So what I do is I pull out my uh, introduction to Biblical Hebrew Syntax by Walt He and O'Connor, 
and I check that the small book, section. book, that little, yes, small this book. big fat book. <laughs> <laughs> and I check the section on, but, and it, it, you know, there are pages and pages of examples of how it's used. Sometimes the bait preposition is used spatially. Sometimes it's used to mark time. It's temporal. Sometimes it denotes the realm of that something is in or the manner with which it's done. So it can have a flexible meaning. So then I look at what are the other examples and what are the kind of criteria that would help us decide what is the most appropriate in this situation. And so I think it's pretty clear that this is not a spatial or temporal use of the preposition Mm -hmm. because it's not indicating location or time. According to might seem like, oh, that that kind of works, but according to is appropriate with regard to monetary standards, and this isn't talking about money. Mm -hmm. So there's two categories that could possibly work with the traditional view of this verse, and that would be realm or manner. So um, we're made with regard to the image of God or made like the image of God. And both of those are possible, but they both require for the author to have in mind or for God to have in mind that the real God's real image is something other than the humans that he's making right there, that mm. they're made according to some other standard that we're not shown in Genesis. Uh. And many people who argue that argue for in or like say, well, there's only one image of God and it's Jesus. Jesus is the image of God and other humans are made like Jesus or in kind of after the image of Jesus. And while that's possible theologically, to me, it seems like a stretch literarily. It seems like a stretch in Genesis because for God to make that statement that would then not make sense to people for thousands of years seems strange. Like there aren't, there aren't other clues in the context that indicate that humans are not quite the image of God. Right, Right. Right. It seems like the point is the opposite. It's clearly that humans aren't God, Right. And, right, and they aren't right. little gods, or they aren't, you know, right. we're not going to grow up to be gods, that kind of thing. Right. But this is a real distinction between God and between those that are B'Tselem. Yes. Yeah. And I think what, what helps then is that there's another category here in Walt Key and O'Connor, and that is a bait of identity. Ah. That would be where the preposition is used to, I'm going to quote from the grammar here, to mark the capacity in which an actor behaves. So it's as or serving as or in the capacity of. I think that this helps us. And there's a couple of examples maybe would be great to give the examples. One is Exodus 6 verse Mm 3, where God announces to Moses, I appeared to Abraham, but El Shaddai. Oh. as El Shaddai. Mm-hmm. He didn't appear like El Shaddai. He didn't appear according to El Shaddai or with regard to El Shaddai. He appeared as El Shaddai. That's how he made himself known mm-hmm. to Abraham. Mm-hmm. And um, another example is Psalm 118, verse 7, where the, the psalmist says, Yahweh is with me, the Ezer. Let's, let me get it. Let me get it in front of me so I can say it right. Yeah. Um, Yahweh is with me, Ba'oz Rai. So it's the word Ezer, which is translated helper or ally, and it's got the same preposition attached to the front of it. Yahweh is with me as my ally or as my helper. Mm -hmm. Um, He's not like a helper. He's he's not being compared to a helper. He's actually helping. And so I would say these two make the most sense as analogies to Genesis 126, that when God makes humans, we're being made as his image. We are the image of God. That's our human identity, just like El Shaddai is God's identity as he reveals it to Abraham. Hmm. So that has enormous payoff, it seems like, as I read your book. Hmm. The book is entitled, make sure I get this out, Being God's Image, Why Creation Still Matters. It has enormous payoff for understanding who we are on the one hand, but also what we are to do and to be in the world as his representatives yeah. really terrific right. idea right yeah i think one of the one of the key payoffs for me when we recognize that that the image is our identity rather than some other quality or capacity we possess is that it can't be lost our identity can't be lost mm. and so many people talk about oh we humans are made in the image of god but then they sin and there's something that's destroyed or lost, like the image status is lost. 
Um, and I think that has troubling ethical implications, which I explore more in the book. Um, so for me, the kind of starting place is to recognize the image of God is what we are. It's who we are and everything that we do should flow from that. And, and because every human is the image of God, that becomes the basis then for ethical treatment of other people. And all of creation. Exactly. By extension. Wonderful yeah. word, Dr. Carmen Joy Imes. Thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. Thanks for having me. If you learn too much today and your head is hurting, there's one sure cure. That is to share this podcast with a friend. We hope you've enjoyed Exegetically Speaking. If you have never visited Wheaton College, I hope you'll make plans to do so. We have a wonderful campus year around. And if biblical languages are your fancy, check out our MA and BA programs at Wheaton College, wheaton.edu. Look for modern and classical languages. That's the best place to get started. If you have comments, you have questions, you just want to be in touch, please email us at exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for all those who make this possible. You know who you are. Until next time, thanks for listening.